Thank you very much. It's good to be back. This was my first time I spoke was actually in this room um, at uh, a breaking convention in 2013, I think, and it was it was even warmer than it is now. Um, I've taken my shoes off. It's kind of a I kind of like this room a bit more. It's a bit more kind of intimate vibe. It feels more kind of like Esalen or something. I'm half tempted to kind of sit cross-legged, but um, the benefit of the cameraman, I won't. Uh, my book which uh, Bernd kindly spoke about. Um, yeah, there's a handful of copies left, we almost sold out now. Um, so please do buy that. Um, okay, so this morning, uh, for those of you that are in my talk, if you weren't, it doesn't really matter. Uh, but I was talking about the DMT state um, and the nature of the DMT state and really why it's so important that we study the DMT state. Um, I think Pascal beautifully illustrated why the DMT state is such an important thing to, to study. So I think you should all be convinced now um, that what I'm going to talk about, kind of, at least part of it, uh, kind of makes some sense. Um, I haven't timed this talk, so I'll just kind of get as far as I can. And, um, some of the weirder stuff comes at the end, so... We'll see how we go. So this morning I was asking questions like, you know, is the DMT world a real world or, or is it a hallucinated world? And, you know, the, the, apart from the kind of the, the conceptual and philosophical problems of trying to understand that question, first of all, let alone trying to answer it, there is also the problem with the DMT state that it is a, an extremely brief state. The last peak of the experience is... Um, it's only a few minutes, normally about you know, five minutes really. By the time you've kind of oriented yourselves in the state, you're normally being dragged back into uh, the consensus world. Um, this is kind of, I think, kind of a nice illustration of uh, kind of the initial phase of the DMT trip. It completely <laughs> overwhelms you. Um, and you know, by the time you've got your intellective tools in order, um, the elves are waving goodbye. Um, so, you know, the, the usual mode of administration of uh, DMT, the kind of the vaping route, um, is perfectly fine, and I'm a big fan of it. Uh, but in, in terms of actually studying the state, taking seriously the idea that these, uh, the DMT state might actually contain um, intelligences, extreme intelligences, uh, way beyond anything within this universe, perhaps. Um, if we take that idea seriously, um, I think we should drop this Sometimes, kind of this attractive romanticism surrounding DMT. Um, I've got nothing against, you know, hand-woven rugs and hand-blown glass pipes and this kind of the ritual. I think that's a, a beautiful thing. Uh, but I think we need to bring our best tools to the table. We need to treat DMT as a technology. Um, and so, today I'll talk about how my uh, small contribution uh, to that endeavour in uh, treating DMT as a technology for interdimensional. So this guy you all know, of course, this is Rick Strassman. So I, I about kind of five years ago, I, I emailed Rick and I said, Rick, I've got this idea. Um, I want to I want to give people this continuous infusion, which I'll talk about in a minute, of DMT. I want to keep them in the DMT space for hours, days. Uh, but I need your data. Um, because I'd seen his data in the papers that he published back in the 90s, so I knew the data existed. So I fired off an email to Rick and within 30 minutes I got an Excel file which had the goods uh, so that was kind of the beginning of my collaboration uh, with Rick. We, this culminated in a paper which I published with Rick in uh, 2016, um, which described this proof of principle model for prolonged uh, immersion in the DMT state uh, using something called target control intravenous infusion. Uh, this was then picked up by a number of uh, popular outlets, including Vice, um, and some guys in Colorado as well. There was a little bit of kind of hype surrounding this. But it, you know, the hype isn't, isn't important here. What's really important is the technology and how we use it and the potential for it. So my idea was, I was kind of thinking about the, the properties of DMT, these kind of pharmacological peculiarities that DMT has, <coughs> reminded me of the pharmacological characteristics that are required for drugs used in anesthesiology. You want to put somebody to sleep uh, for several hours. What you don't do is just give them an injection of a long-acting drug because the drug tends to rise 
uh, and then begins to fall. And it's very difficult to control. So what you actually do is inject them with a, a short-acting drug um, that is metabolized rather quickly and use a programmed infusion device, which looks kind of like this, where you can, uh, within this is a, a computer that you can program uh, to deliver a controlled rate of in, uh, a continuous infusion of the drug into the bloodstream and thus into the brain. Sounds like a very simple idea, but of course, um, simple ideas often behind them have rather complex science, and that's the case here. Um, so, yeah, this is another. So you can see um, the, the syringe here. Uh, this is for propofol, which is a uh, general anesthetic. Uh, but um, and the idea is that this would deliver a, uh, this would be controlled, this pump would be controlled by uh, this program which you input. So, whenever a drug enters the body, immediately things start happening. The body starts responding. The, the drug starts, to, first of all, to be distributed to various tissues in the body. Um, the body starts to metabolize it, starts to break it down with the aim of getting rid of it uh, as a toxin. Um, and so, that means really, generally, that whenever you give someone a drug, you are putting that drug into an extremely complex system. Um, and so, trying to kind of maintain a stable level of DMT in the brain, which is really what's required here, in the same way that during uh, anesthesia, the idea is that you bring the level of the anesthetic drug to a, the correct level, not too high, you don't want someone dying on the operating table, you also don't want them waking up. So there's a window uh, of blood, uh, sorry, brain drug concentration that you need to maintain the drug within. And it's the same with this idea of DMT, is that you would bring someone into the DMT state, and then you would maintain the DMT level in the brain uh, over time, uh, potentially in a, an indefinite period of time. Initially it would be, as, as Dave suggested, perhaps 30 minutes, but then there's no, there's no theoretical end to that. So this is a little bit technical, uh, I won't go into too much detail, but basically this is kind of what we need to think about when we're introducing drugs into the body. We need to this we basically introduce drug into what's called the central compartment. This is your main vasculature. So when you introduce drug, it goes into your uh, normally your, your venal system, your veins. Uh, then it starts to distribute with uh, other compartments. So this is like smaller blood vessels with perhaps with with fats uh, and uh, and other tissues. And eventually, it makes its way uh, to what's called the effect compartment, which in the case of psychedelic drugs and with anaesthetic drugs, of course, the effect compartment is the brain itself. The idea is that by understanding the various rates at which the drug moves and shifts and distributes and metabolizes, um, uh, eliminated here, uh, you can actually try and control uh, the level of drug in the brain. So this is what a target control, is. so the target control here refers to <coughs> the desired target concentration of DMT in the brain uh, and introducing venous infusion, uh, self-explanatory. So we can see here initially, um, when the, the drug is given, you get a, a spike in plasma concentration, a spike in the blood, and then this dotted line shows the effect side concentration. That's the, the concentration in the brain. And this is a uh, not really a realistic example. It never works as well as this. Uh, this is just to illustrate. Uh, but you notice that the dotted line here shows the concentration in the brain, so you can bring it up to a desired level, and then you can raise it high. And you have actually real-time control um, in, if your model is good real-time control over the level of the drug in the brain. And of course, in the case of DMT, that would mean uh, you could bring someone into a uh, kind of a, a light state and you could push them further gradually uh, and, and bring them back as well if they're having a, a tough time. So, for a drug to be amenable to target control intravenous infusion, it needs to have certain pharmacological properties. Um, it needs to have a rapid onset of clinical effects. Uh, it needs to be a, a drug of short duration. If it's not, it's a sticky drug, or a drug that's not metabolized very quickly, uh, then it tends to build up and build up and build up. It's very difficult to control uh, the level of drug in the body and the brain. It needs to have a uh, low tolerance. Uh, this means that um, the, the effect of the drug, the desired effect of the drug, whether it's anesthesia or uh, the DMT state, the breakthrough DMT state, uh, mustn't diminish over time. And of course it needs to have a favourable uh, side effect profile, it can't have toxic uh, metabolites and, and things like that. Because you're delivering the drug continuously over a long period of time. So DMT, yes, very rapidly active. 
short duration of action, uh, of action, check, we're good. Favorable side effect profile, fabulous. DMT doesn't have any toxic metabolites, very clean, very cleanly removed from the body um, with no known uh, toxic effects. So the only one left is this uh, issue of tolerance. Um, that, until Rick did his work, that was um, not quite clear actually. Um, anecdotally, people say, oh, DMT has, if you go on various Facebook DMT sites, they will tell you quite knowledgeably that DMT has um, you know, very rapid tolerance, etc., etc. That's bullshit. Uh, with uh, LSD and psilocybin, for example, your first dose um, might be you know, the desired effect, but if you repeat the same dose, perhaps you know, the following day or a couple of days later, you, you often find that the effect is, is much diminished. Whereas um, what Rick Strassman was able to show, and this is a really important result uh, from his, uh, his very large study, which everyone of course is very familiar with uh, from the 90s, this, perhaps this result less well known, but he demonstrated that there was no um, tolerance, subjective tolerance of DMT, so he would give DMT to people uh, over, I think, 30 minute intervals, the same dose, and then measure the intensity of the ex experience using his uh, who's in the gym rating scale, uh, and he found that the effect was the same every time. So that's really cool. So that means um, that the repeated doses of DMT don't have diminished effects. So this is, means we can kind of complete uh, our requirements. So we're kind of good to go. Uh, so then the, the task is to actually create a uh, pharmacokinetic model. So this is a, a mathematical computational exercise, uh, which is really my uh, contribution to this, apart from having the idea. Um, and um, this was based upon Rick's blood data. So Rick, um, as well as recording all these beautiful trip reports, which formed part of DMT, the spirit molecule, uh, he also was taking blood samples of the subjects at, at intervals, uh, which turned out to be the, the, the key data that I, I, I required. Uh, so I have um, the blood concentrations of, of all of these participants at um, timed intervals. And this data can then be used uh, to generate this, this what's called a pharmacokinetic uh, model, uh, with the aim being then that you would be able to, as I said, bring someone into the DMT state, hold them within the DMT space, within the DMT reality for an extended period of time, and then bring them out again. Now, People always say this to me, haven't you heard of ayahuasca? As if I hadn't. Uh, but of course, whilst the, the ayahuasca experience is an extended DMT experience to an extent, it's not a pure DMT experience. It's not the, the, the level of, of DMT in the brain is not regulated. It rises and it falls, yes, over a much longer time scale, uh, but th there's certainly no stable concentration of DMT in the brain. So ayahuasca is not a substitute, I'm afraid. Also, Quite pertinently, the average, and again, people have looked at the blood concentration of ayahuasca um, over time, and the, the average peak in a, an ayahuasca experience, the average DMT blood concentration is, is about 15 to 18 nanograms per milliliter, where it, it, it goes to above 100 uh, with IV DMT, uh, or just smoke DMT. If you smoke DMT in a pipe, you will achieve uh, this kind of level, if you achieve breakthrough you'll achieve these kind of levels, much higher than achieved with ayahuasca. So this is, this is next level stuff. So the next task was to fit Strassman's data to uh, this mathematical model. I won't bore you with the details, but this is, uh, shows uh, Rick's data points in red here. And this is my mathematical model. You see it fits the data quite nicely. This allowed us then to actually model a typical dose uh, and using the mathematical model to actually see, well, what, what does that predict is actually happening in the brain? Um, and we noticed that around kind of just a, about a minute into the experience, uh, sorry, after the, um, the DMT is administered, uh, it, well, this is just a normal regular injection, by the way. Um, you reach around 60 nanograms per, per milliliter in the, um, in the brain. Uh, and this trigger, this is basically the threshold for entry into the DMT space. Uh, then it continues to rise uh, and then begins to fall. The peak is around three minutes. Uh, then begins to fall and you exit the DMT space at about sort of the, the eight minute mark. And this kind of matches very, very closely uh, what uh, Rick Strassman actually found in his study. So it seems that the model that uh, I developed seems to work. So then we can 
uh, take the model and think about uh, actually applying it to this continuous infusion protocol. So for this, um, I use the, what's called the Bolus Elimination Transfer Protocol. Uh, funny sounding name, but basically uh, the idea is that the initial bolus, which is just the initial injection of the drug, uh, is used to bring the brain level of DMT uh, to the point where you, uh, the individual breaks through, and then you start the infusion. So this is the elimination transfer, the idea, idea being that you would compensate for the, the drug being lost through uh, metabolism and excretion uh, in order to maintain the level of DMT in the brain. So in, in the case of this model, you would begin the infusion uh, at around two minutes after the initial uh, very brief infusion of uh, the initial bolus of 25 milligrams of DMT. So when you look at that, um, the results of that, you can see you get a huge spike in the plasma levels, but the levels of DMT in the brain, uh, shown by the red line here, kind of rise and then settle. Uh, and this is around kind of a breakthrough dose. So with this protocol in a, in a living human being, we would expect an average human being uh, you would uh, ideally be able to hold them within the DMT space for uh, as long as you wanted. So, <laughs> so the, the Imperial team have already, as Dave mentioned, kind of have taken up the mantle here and said, okay, let's see if we can work this in humans. They have a kind of a very academic uh, approach to this, as you would expect, uh, being the kind of really the most important psychedelic research group in the world, I would say. Um, there he is. Um, and there's another, <laughs> there's another group in Colorado called DMTX.org who are actually uh, coming from, at this from a kind of a different angle uh, where they want to, uh, they're actually recruiting people already. So if you want to kind of um, get involved, don't email me. That's uh, uh, you know, Just email the team guy. Go to their website and email them uh, and they will. Um, they will get back to um, So, <laughs> earlier when I was talking, I was talking about this idea that you know, the brain is always constructing a model of reality, um, and that the brain essentially learned to construct your model of the world um, over time. Now, when you're thrust into the DMT space, um, the brain is initially, this is why uh, within the first five minutes, or often throughout the whole of a normal kind of smoked DMT hit, you're kind of, you're very, very disoriented. What I would expect to happen over time, uh, perhaps over several hours, is it would begin to stabilize as the brain learns to construct a model of that, that environment. Uh, and this would then make the, the DMT state amenable to proper exploration uh, and, you know, testing and uh, all that kind of stuff you, that you might do. And we would, I imagine, uh, teams of various disciplines, mathematicians, uh, anthropologists, psychologists, cartographers, perhaps linguists, uh, artists, neuroscientists, physicians, theologians, a variety of people would form this, uh, this team, this exploration team, uh, that would uh, help uh, um, the aim being to kind of map and uh, explore and, uh, you know, this kind of new domain, as you would any other kind of new domain. Um, we all know who this guy is. Uh, actually, Timothy Leary, uh, back in the back in the 60s, everyone associates him with turn on tuning drop out and flowers in his hair and that kind of stuff. But actually, um, Timothy Leary was kind of interested in trying to bring back information from the DMT space, and that's really what this is about. It's about going into the DMT space and trying to bring back information. Uh, and, and Timothy Leary um, wrote this lovely little paper in the Cycle Review, uh, where he actually was in real time delivering the information back. So I imagine a time when you would actually um, put someone into the DMT space and they would actually um, transmit information directly to the, the expert, if you like, waiting on the other side. Uh, and he had, you know, he had this kind of equipment that he invented um, to actually enable you to communicate whilst you're in this um, space. Prizes for guessing who these are. Metzner. Metzner. Alpha. Alpha, yeah. So this is, uh, this is Metzner with uh, Timothy Leary's experiential typewriter. So in the future, 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 I really do imagine a time where we're, you, you're going to lie down in some kind of pod um, and you will input um, you know, your journey time uh, and you will set off to the universe uh, next door. Now for extended, extended periods, if you want to go in there for several days, you need to think about a number of issues here. You've got nutrition, first of all. Uh, you've also got waste. 
deal with. Uh, there are um, ways of dealing with that. I'll just talk about nutrition. So uh, total parenteral nutrition is basically a means of delivering food, uh, all the nutrients required uh, by a human into their bloodstream directly. So you can put someone into this machine, into this pod, hooked up to the, the D-matrix machine for days or weeks or months or years. And we could be in one now! <laughs> <laughs> okay, weirdly, this is, yeah, I've got a couple minutes. Um, my friend uh, uh, David J. Brown has written, written quite a few books on, on psychedelics. He, he, um, he messaged me, I, I finished the presentation, messaged me just a couple of weeks ago, and he said, okay, I've read this report from D.M. Turner, not his real name, uh, the late D.M. Turner, I think he fell off the roof. Oh, he drowned in the bath. Oh, he drowned in the bath. Off the roof. Anyway, <laughs> anyway, he's dead. Uh, so they, and this, he describes this trip report where he enters this place. Uh, the place he enters was some type of research centre. Uh, the attention was focused on these large metallic pods, um, and the, uh, yes, this pods were something like an isolation chamber. They're shaped like large coffins, about eight feet long, um, and the beings who use these pods looks exactly like humans. Um, and then he describes. Uh, how the, the, the nutrition was delivered um, and heat and, uh, and all that kind of stuff to these individuals. The pods don't sound familiar. Uh, watch the Matrix. <laughs> maybe. No, this was pre-Matrix. 996. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, and the whole purpose of these pods of this research center was that this was the method the people here used to increase the level of DMT in the brains of the pod sleepers. So one fortunate enough to be a researcher, so you will go into a pod for weeks or months at a time. The wow. DT levels in their brain will be significantly increased and they would spend their time having the most fascinating dreams. So that's the future. Um, Mark, when he was giving a talk, was um, talking about this idea perhaps that you would, my idea really, that, that ultimately, uh, as um, this Soviet rocket scientist said, and has been echoed many times by Terence McKenna, the Earth is the cradle of humanity, but mankind cannot stay in the cradle forever. And uh, whilst he was talking about perhaps leaving the Earth, I'm talking about something much more dramatic, uh, as I described in the book, uh, the idea of actually leaving um, the material realm completely. Now, it's not suicide. It's only suicide if you die. Uh, and this would be transference. This would not be. This would be leaving uh, the material world exactly, uh, completely. And perhaps we could leave this earth to kind of recover from our uh, rather uh, toxic presence. I don't know. Uh, but whether you agree with that or not, uh, that's a whole different topic of discussion. I think we can all agree with E. Cummings, who said, "Listen, there's a hell of a universe next door. Let's go." Thank you. <laughs>